Story 13 of Round the Fire Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 13 The Usher of Lee House School. Mr. Lumsden, the senior partner of Lumsden and Westmacott, the well known scholastic and clerical agents, was a small, dapper man with a sharp, abrupt manner, a critical eye, and an incisive way of speaking your name sir said he sitting pen in hand with his long red-lined folio in front of him harold weld oxford or cambridge cambridge honours no sir athlete nothing remarkable i am afraid not a blue oh no mr lumsden shook his head despondently and shrugged his shoulders in a way which sent my hopes down to zero there is a very keen competition for masterships mr weld said he the vacancies are few and the applicants innumerable a first-class athlete or or cricketer or a man who has passed very high in his examinations can usually find a vacancy i might say always in the case of the cricketer but the average man if you will excuse the description mr weld has a very great difficulty almost an insurmountable difficulty we have already more than a hundred such names upon our lists and if you think it worth while our adding yours i dare say that in the course of some years we may possibly be able to find you some opening which he paused on account of a knock at the door it was a clerk with a note mr lumsden broke the seal and read it why mr weld said he this is really rather an interesting coincidence i understand you to say that latin and english are your subjects and that you would prefer for a time to accept a place in an elementary establishment where you would have time for private study quite so this note contains a request from an old client of ours dr phelps mccarthy of willow lee house academy west hampstead that i should at once send him a young man who should be qualified to teach latin and english to a small class of boys under fourteen years of age his vacancy appears to be the very one which you are looking for the terms are not munificent sixty pounds board lodging and washing but the work is not onerous and you would have the evenings to yourself that would do i cried with all the eagerness of the man who sees work at last after weary months of seeking i don't know that it is quite fair to these gentlemen whose names have been so long upon our list said mr lumsden glancing down at his open ledger but the coincidence is so striking that i feel we must really give you the refusal of it then i accept it sir and i am much obliged to you there is one small provision in dr mccarthy's letter he stipulates that the applicant must be a man with an imperturbably good temper i am the very man said i with conviction well said mr lumsden with some hesitation i hope that your temper is really as good as you say for i rather fancy that you may need it i presume that every elementary schoolmaster does yes sir but it is only fair to you to warn you that there may be some especially trying circumstances in this particular situation dr phelps mccarthy does not make such a condition without some very good and pressing reason there was a certain solemnity in his speech which struck a chill in the delight with which i had welcomed this providential vacancy may i ask the nature of these circumstances i asked we endeavor to hold the balance equally between our clients and to be perfectly frank with all of them if i knew of objections to you i should certainly communicate them to dr mccarthy and so i have no hesitation in doing as much for you i find he continued glancing over the pages of his ledger that within the last twelve months we have supplied no fewer than seven latin masters to willow lee house academy four of them having left so abruptly as to forfeit their month's salary and none of them having stayed more than eight weeks and the other masters have they stayed there is only one other residential master and he appears to be unchanged you can understand mr weld continued the agent closing both the ledger and the interview that such rapid changes are not desirable from a master's point of view whatever may be said for them by an agent working on commission 
I have no idea why these gentlemen have resigned their situation so early. I can only give you the facts, and advise you to see Dr. McCarthy at once, and to form your own conclusions. Great is the power of the man who has nothing to lose, and it was therefore with perfect serenity, but with a good deal of curiosity, that I rang early that afternoon the heavy wrought iron bell of the Willow Lee House Academy. The building was a massive pile, square and ugly, standing in its own extensive grounds, with a broad carriage sweep curving up to it from the road. It stood high and commanded a view on the one side of the grey roofs and bristling spires of northern London, and on the other of the well-wooded and beautiful country which fringes the great city. The door was opened by a boy in buttons, and I was shown into a well-appointed study, where the principal of the academy presently joined me. The warnings and insinuations of the agent had prepared me to meet a choleric and overbearing person, one whose manner was an insupportable provocation to those who worked under him. Anything further from the reality cannot be imagined. He was a frail, gentle creature, clean-shaven and round-shouldered, with a bearing which was so courteous that it became almost deprecating. His bushy hair was thickly shot with grey, and his age I should imagine to verge upon sixty. His voice was low and suave, and he walked with a certain mincing delicacy of manner. His whole appearance was that of a kindly scholar, who was more at home among his books than in the practical affairs of the world. "'I am sure that we shall be very happy to have your assistance, Mr. Weld,' said he, after a few professional questions. "'Mr. Percival Manners left me yesterday, and I should be glad if you could take over his duties to-morrow.' "'May I ask if that is Mr. Percival Manners of Selwyn?' I asked. "'Precisely. Did you know him?' "'Yes, he is a friend of mine. An excellent teacher, but a little hasty in his disposition. It was his only fault.' Now, in your case, Mr. Weld, is your own temper under good control? Supposing, for argument's sake, that I were to so far forget myself as to be rude to you, or to speak roughly, or to jar your feelings in any way, could you rely upon yourself to control your emotions? I smiled at the idea of this courteous little mincing creature ruffling my nerves. I think that I could answer for it, sir, said I. Quarrels are very painful to me, said he. I wish every one to live in harmony under my roof. I will not deny Mr. Percival Manners had provocations, but I wish to find a man who can raise himself above provocation, and sacrifice his own feelings for the sake of peace and concord. I will do my best, sir. You cannot say more, Mr. Weld. In that case I shall expect you to-night, if you can get your things ready so soon." I not only succeeded in getting my things ready, but I found time to call at the Benedict Club in Piccadilly, where I knew that I should find manners if he were still in town. There he was, sure enough, in the smoking-room, and I questioned him over a cigarette as to his reasons for throwing up his recent situation. "'You don't tell me that you are going to Dr. Phelps McCarthy Academy,' he cried, staring at me in surprise. "'My dear chap, it's no use. You can't possibly remain there.' But I saw him, and he seemed the most courtly, inoffensive fellow. I never met a man with more gentle manners. "'He? Oh, he's all right. There's no vice in him. Have you seen Theophilus St. James?' "'I have never heard the name. Who is he?' "'Your colleague, the other master.' no i have not seen him he's the terror if you can stand him you have either the spirit of a perfect christian or else you have no spirit at all a more perfect bounder never bounded but why does mccarthy stand it my friend looked at me significantly through his cigarette smoke and shrugged his shoulders you will form your own conclusions about that mine were formed very soon and i never found occasion to alter them it would help me very much if you would tell me them. When you see a man in his own house allowing his business to be ruined, his comfort destroyed, and his authority defied by another man in a subordinate position, and calmly submitting to it without so much as a word of protest, what conclusion do you come to? That the one has a hold over the other. Percival Manners nodded his head. There you are. You've hit it first barrel. It seems to me that there's no other explanation which will cover the facts. 
at some period in his life the little doctor has gone astray humanum est errare i have even done it myself but this was something serious and the other man got a hold of it and has never let go that's the truth blackmail is at the bottom of it but he had no hold over me and there was no reason why i should stand his insolence so i came away and i very much expect to see you do the same for some time he talked over the matter but he always came to the same conclusion that i should not retain my new situation very long it was with no very pleasant feelings after this preparation that i found myself face to face with the very man of whom i had received so evil an account dr mccarthy introduced us to each other in his study on the evening of that same day immediately after my arrival at the school this is your new colleague mr st james said he in his genial courteous fashion i trust that you will mutually agree and that i shall find nothing but good feeling and sympathy beneath this roof i shared the good doctor's hope but my expectations of it were not increased by the appearance of my confrere he was a young bull-necked fellow about thirty years of age dark-eyed and black-haired with an exceedingly vigorous physique i have never seen a more strongly built man though he tended to run to fat in a way which showed that he was in the worst of training his face was coarse swollen and brutal with a pair of small black eyes deeply sunken in his head his heavy jowl his projecting ears and his thick bandy legs all went to make up a personality which was as formidable as it was repellent i hear you've never been out before said he in a rude brusque fashion well it's a poor life hard work and starvation pay as you'll find out for yourself but it has some compensations said the principal surely you will allow that mr st james has it i never could find them what do you call compensations even to be in the continual presence of youth is a privilege it has the effect of keeping youth in one's own soul for one reflects something of their high spirits and their keen enjoyment of life little beasts cried my colleague oh come come mr st james you are too hard upon them i hate the sight of them if i could put them and their blessed copy-books and lexicons and slates into one bonfire i'd do it to-night this is mr st james's way of talking said the principal smiling nervously as he glanced at me you must not take him too seriously now mr weld you know where your room is and no doubt you have your own little arrangements to make the sooner you make them the sooner you will feel yourself at home it seemed to me that he was only too anxious to remove me at once from the influence of this extraordinary colleague and i was glad to go for the conversation had become embarrassing and so began an epoch which always seems to me as i look back to it to be the most singular in all my experience the school was in many ways an excellent one dr phelps mccarthy was an ideal principal his methods were modern and rational the management was all that could be desired and yet in the middle of this well-ordered machine there intruded the incongruous and impossible mr st james throwing everything into confusion his duties were to teach english and mathematics and how he acquitted himself of them i do not know as our classes were held in separate rooms i can answer for it however that the boys feared him and loathed him and i know that they had good reason to do so for frequently my own teaching was interrupted by his bellowings of anger and even by the sound of his blows dr mccarthy spent most of his time in his class but it was i suspect to watch over the master rather than the boys and to try to moderate his ferocious temper when it threatened to become dangerous it was in his bearing to the headmaster however that my colleague's conduct was most outrageous the first conversation which i have recorded proved to be typical of their intercourse he domineered over him openly and brutally i have heard him contradict him roughly before the whole school at no time would he show him any mark of respect and my temper often rose within me when i saw the quiet acquiescence of the old doctor and his patient tolerance of this monstrous treatment and yet the sight of it surrounded the principal also with a certain vague horror in my mind for supposing my friend's theory to be correct and i could devise no better one 
how black must have been the story which could be held over his head by this man and by fear of its publicity force him to undergo such humiliations this quiet gentle doctor might be a profound hypocrite a criminal a forger possibly or a poisoner only such a secret as this could account for the complete power which the young man held over him why else should he admit so hateful a presence into his house and so harmful an influence into his school why should he submit to degradations which could not be witnessed far less endured without indignation and yet if it were so i was forced to confess that my principal carried it off with extraordinary duplicity never by word or sign did he show that the young man's presence was distasteful to him i have seen him look pained it is true after some peculiarly outrageous exhibition but he gave me the impression that it was always on account of the scholars or of me never on account of himself he spoke to and of st james in an indulgent fashion smiling gently at what made my blood boil within me in his way of looking at him and addressing him one could see no trace of resentment but rather a sort of timid and deprecating good will his company he certainly courted and they spent many hours together in the study and the garden as to my own relations with theophilus st james i made up my mind from the beginning that i would keep my temper with him and to that resolution i steadfastly adhered if dr mccarthy chose to permit this disrespect and to condone these outrages it was his affair and not mine it was evident that his one wish was that there should be peace between us and i felt that i could help him best by respecting this desire my easiest way to do so was to avoid my colleague and this i did to the best of my ability when we were thrown together i was quiet polite and reserved he on his part showed me no ill will but met me rather with a coarse joviality and a rough familiarity which he meant to be ingratiating he was insistent in his attempts to get me into his room at night for the purpose of playing euchre and of drinking old mccarthy doesn't mind said he don't you be afraid of him we'll do what we like and i'll answer for it that he won't object once only i went and when i left after a dull and gross evening my host was stretched dead drunk upon the sofa after that i gave the excuse of a course of study and spent my spare hours alone in my own room one point upon which i was anxious to gain information was as to how long these proceedings had been going on when did st james assert his hold over dr mccarthy from neither of them could i learn how long my colleague had been in his present situation one or two leading questions upon my part were eluded or ignored in a manner so marked that it was easy to see that they were both of them as eager to conceal the point as i was to know it but at last one evening i had the chance of a chat with mrs carter the matron for the doctor was a widower and from her i got the information which i wanted it needed no questioning to get at her knowledge for she was so full of indignation that she shook with passion as she spoke of it and raised her hands into the air in the earnestness of her denunciation as she described the grievances which she had against my colleague it was three years ago mr well that he first darkened this doorstep she cried three bitter years they have been to me the school had fifty boys then now it has twenty-two that's what he has done for us in three years in another three there won't be one and the doctor that angel of patience you see how he treats him though he is not fit to lace his boots for him if it wasn't for the doctor you may be sure that i wouldn't stay an hour under the same roof with such a man and so i told him to his own face mr weld if the doctor would only pack him about his business but i know that i am saying more than i should she stopped herself with an effort and spoke no more upon the subject she had remembered that i was almost a stranger in the school and she feared that she had been indiscreet there were one or two very singular points about my colleague the chief one was that he rarely took any exercise there was a playing field within the college grounds and that was his farthest point if the boys went out it was i or dr mccarthy who accompanied them 
St. James gave as a reason for this that he had injured his knee some years before, and that walking was painful to him. For my own part I put it down to pure laziness upon his part, for he was of an obese, heavy temperament. Twice, however, I saw him from my window stealing out of the grounds late at night, and the second time I watched him return in the grey of the morning and slink in through an open window. These furtive excursions were never alluded to, but they exposed the hollowness of his story about his knee, and they increased the dislike and distrust which I had of the man. His nature seemed to be vicious to the core. Another point, small but suggestive, was that he hardly ever during the month that I was at Willow Lee House received any letters, and on those few occasions they were obviously tradesmen's bills. I am an early riser, and used every morning to pick my own correspondence out of the bundle upon the hall table. I could judge, therefore, how few were ever there for Mr. Theophilus St. James. There seemed to me to be something peculiarly ominous in this. What sort of a man could he be who, during thirty years of life, had never made a single friend, high or low, who cared to continue to keep in touch with him? And yet the sinister fact remained that the headmaster not only tolerated, but was even intimate with him. More than once on entering a room I have found them talking confidentially together, and they would walk arm in arm in deep conversation up and down the garden paths. So curious did I become to know what the tie was which bound them that I found it gradually push out my other interests and become the main purpose of my life. In school and out of school, at meals and at play, I was perpetually engaged in watching Dr. Phelps McCarthy and Mr. Theophilus St. James, and endeavouring to solve the mystery which surrounded them. But unfortunately my curiosity was a little too open. I had not the art to conceal the suspicions which I felt about the relations which existed between these two men, and the nature of the hold which the one appeared to have over the other. It may have been my manner of watching them, it may have been some indiscreet question, but it is certain that I showed too clearly what I felt. One night I was conscious that the eyes of Theophilus St. James were fixed upon me in a surly and menacing stare. I had a foreboding of evil, and I was not surprised when Dr. McCarthy called me next morning into his study. "'I'm very sorry, Mr. Weld,' said he, "'but I am afraid that I shall be compelled to dispense with your services.' "'Perhaps you would give me some reason for dismissing me,' I answered, for I was conscious of having done my duties to the best of my power, and knew well that only one reason could be given. "'I have no fault to find with you,' said he, and the colour came to his cheeks. "'You send me away at the suggestion of my colleague.' His eyes turned away from mine. "'We will not discuss the question, Mr. Weld. It is impossible for me to discuss it.' In justice to you, I will give you the strongest recommendation for your next situation. I can say no more. I hope that you will continue your duties here until you have found a place elsewhere. My whole soul rose against the injustice of it, and yet I had no appeal and no redress. I could only bow and leave the room with a bitter sense of ill usage at my heart. My first instinct was to pack my boxes and leave the house, but the headmaster had given me permission to remain until I had found another situation. I was sure that St. James desired me to go, and that was a strong reason why I should stay. If my presence annoyed him, I should give him as much of it as I could. I had begun to hate him and to long to have my revenge upon him. If he had a hold over our principal, might not I in turn obtain one over him? It was a sign of weakness that he should be so afraid of my curiosity. He would not resent it so much if he had not something to fear from it. I entered my name once more upon the books of the agents, but meanwhile I continued to fulfill my duties at Willow Lee House, and so it came about that I was present at the denouement of this singular situation. During that week, for it was only a week before the crisis came, I was in the habit of going down each evening, after the work of the day was done, to inquire about my new arrangements. One night it was a cold and windy evening in March. I had just stepped out from the hall door when a strange sight met my eyes. 
A man was crouching before one of the windows of the house. His knees were bent, and his eyes were fixed upon the small line of light between the curtain and the sash. The window threw a square of brightness in front of it, and in the middle of this the dark shadow of this ominous visitor showed clear and hard. It was but for an instant that I saw him, for he glanced up and was off in a moment through the shrubbery. I could hear the patter of his feet as he ran down the road until it died away in the distance. It was evidently my duty to turn back and to tell Dr. McCarthy what I had seen. I found him in his study. I had expected him to be disturbed at such an incident, but I was not prepared for the state of panic into which he fell. He leaned back in his chair, white and gasping, like one who has received a mortal blow. "'Which window, Mr. Weld?' he asked, wiping his forehead. "'Which window was it?' "'The next to the dining-room, Mr. St. James' window. "'Dear me, dear me, this is indeed unfortunate. "'A man looking through Mr. St. James' window. "'He wrung his hands like a man who is at his wit's end what to do. "'I shall be passing the police station, sir. "'Would you wish me to mention the matter?' "'Oh, no, no!' he cried, suddenly mastering his extreme agitation. I have no doubt that it was some poor tramp who intended to beg. I attach no importance to the incident, none at all. Don't let me detain you, Mr. Weld, if you wish to go out. I left him sitting in his study with reassuring words upon his lips, but with horror upon his face. My heart was heavy for my little employer as I started off once more for town. As I looked back from the gate at the square of light which marked the window of my colleague, I suddenly saw the black outline of Mr. McCarthy's figure passing against the lamp. He had hastened from his study then to tell St. James what he had heard. What was the meaning of it all, this atmosphere of mystery, this inexplicable terror, these confidences between two such dissimilar men? I thought and thought as I walked, but do what I would, I could not hit upon any adequate conclusion. I little knew how near I was to the solution of the problem. It was very late, nearly twelve o'clock, when I returned, and the lights were all out save one in the doctor's study. The black, gloomy house loomed before me as I walked up the drive, its somber bulk broken only by the one glimmering point of brightness. I let myself in with my latch-key and was about to enter my own room when my attention was arrested by a short, sharp cry like that of a man in pain. I stood and listened, my hand upon the handle of my door. All was silent in the house, save for a distant murmur of voices which came, I knew, from the doctor's room. I stole quietly down the corridor in that direction. The sound resolved itself now into two voices, the rough, bullying tones of St. James and the lower tone of the doctor, the one apparently insisting and the other arguing and pleading. Four thin lines of light in the blackness showed me the door of the doctor's room, and step by step I drew nearer to it in the darkness. St. James' voice within arose louder and louder, and his words now came plainly to my ear. "'I'll have every pound of it. If you don't give it to me, I'll take it. Do you hear?' Dr. McCarthy's reply was inaudible, but the angry voice broke in again. "'Leave you destitute? I leave you this little gold mine of a school, and that's enough for one old man, is it not? How am I to set up in Australia without money? Answer me that.' Again the doctor said something in a soothing voice, but his answer only roused his companion to a higher pitch of fury. "'Done for me? What have you ever done for me except that you couldn't help doing?' It was for your good name, not for my safety, that you cared. But enough, Cackle. I must get on my way before morning. Will you open your safe, or will you not? Oh, James, how can you use me so? cried a wailing voice, and then there came a sudden little scream of pain. At the sound of that helpless appeal from brutal violence, I lost for once that temper upon which I had prided myself. Every bit of manhood in me cried out against any further neutrality. With my walking cane in my hand, I rushed into the study. As I did so, I was conscious that the hall door bell was violently ringing. "'You villain!' I cried. "'Let him go!' The two men were standing in front of a small safe, which stood against one wall of the doctor's room. St. James held the old man by the wrist, and he had twisted his arm round in order to force him to produce the key. My little headmaster, white but resolute, was struggling furiously in the grip of the burly athlete. 
the bully glared over his shoulder at me with a mixture of fury and terror upon his brutal features then realizing that i was alone he dropped his victim and made for me with a horrible curse you infernal spy he cried i'll do for you anyhow before i leave i am not a very strong man and i realized that i was helpless if once at close quarters twice i cut at him with my stick but he rushed in at me with a murderous growl and seized me by the throat with both his muscular hands i fell backwards and he on the top of me with a grip which was squeezing the life from me i was conscious of his malignant yellow-tinged eyes within a few inches of my own and then with a beating of pulses in my head and a singing in my ears my senses slipped away from me but even in that supreme moment i was aware that the doorbell was still violently ringing when i came to myself i was lying upon the sofa in dr mccarthy's study and the doctor himself was seated beside me he appeared to be watching me intently and anxiously for as i opened my eyes and looked about me he gave a great cry of relief thank god he cried thank god where is he i asked looking round the room as i did so i became aware that the furniture was scattered in every direction and that there were traces of an even more violent struggle than that in which i had been engaged the doctor sank his face between his hands they have him he groaned after these years of trial they have him again but how thankful i am that he has not for a second time stained his hands in blood as the doctor spoke i became aware that a man in the braided jacket of an inspector of police was standing in the doorway yes sir he remarked you have had a pretty narrow escape if we had not got in when we did you would not be here to tell the tale i don't know that i ever saw any one much nearer to the undertaker i sat up with my hands to my throbbing head dr mccarthy said i this is all a mystery to me i should be glad if you could explain to me who this man is and why you have tolerated him so long in your house i owe you an explanation mr weld and the more so since you have in so chivalrous a fashion almost sacrificed your life in my defence there is no reason now for secrecy in a word mr weld this unhappy man's real name is james mccarthy and he is my only son your son alas yes what sin have i ever committed that i should have such a punishment he has made my whole life a misery from the first years of his boyhood violent headstrong selfish unprincipled he has always been the same at eighteen he was a criminal at twenty in a paroxysm of passion he took the life of a boon companion and was tried for murder he only just escaped the gallows and he was condemned to penal servitude three years ago he succeeded in escaping and managed in face of a thousand obstacles to reach my house in london my wife's heart had been broken by his condemnation and as he had succeeded in getting a suit of ordinary clothes there was no one here to recognize him for months he lay concealed in the attics until the first search of the police should be over then i gave him employment here as you have seen though by his rough and overbearing manners he made my own life miserable and that of his fellow-masters unbearable you have been with us for four months mr weld but no other master endured him so long i apologize now for all you have had to submit to but i ask you what else could i do for his dead mother's sake i could not let harm come to him as long as it was in my power to fend it off only under my roof could he find a refuge the only spot in all the world and how could i keep him here without its exciting remark unless i gave him some occupation i made him english master therefore and in that capacity i have protected him here for three years you have no doubt observed that he never during the daytime went beyond the college grounds you now understand the reason but when to-night you came to me with your report of a man who was looking through his window i understood that his retreat was at last discovered i besought him to fly at once but he had been drinking the unhappy fellow and my words fell upon deaf ears when at last he made up his mind to go he wished to take from me in his flight every shilling which i possessed it was your entrance which saved me from him while the police in turn arrived only just in time to rescue you i have made myself amenable to the law by harboring an escaped prisoner 
and remain here in the custody of the inspector but a prison has no terrors for me after what i have endured in this house during the last three years it seems to me doctor said the inspector that if you have broken the law you have had quite enough punishment already god knows i have cried dr mccarthy and sank his haggard face upon his hands End of story 13story fourteen of round the fire stories by arthur conan doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain story fourteen the brown hand every one knows that sir dominic holden the famous indian surgeon made me his heir and that his death changed me in an hour from a hard-working and impecunious medical man to a well-to-do landed proprietor many know also that there were at least five people between the inheritance and me and that sir dominic's selection appeared to be altogether arbitrary and whimsical i can assure them however that they are quite mistaken and that although i only knew sir dominic in the closing years of his life there were none the less very real reasons why he should show his good will towards me as a matter of fact though i say it myself no man ever did more for another than i did for my indian uncle i cannot expect the story to be believed but it is so singular that i should feel that it was a breach of duty if i did not put it upon record so here it is and your belief or incredulity is your own affair sir dominic holden c b k c s i and i don't know what besides was the most distinguished indian surgeon of his day in the army originally he afterwards settled down into civil practice in bombay and visited as a consultant every part of india his name is best remembered in connection with the oriental hospital which he founded and supported the time came however when his iron constitution began to show signs of the long strain to which he had subjected it and his brother practitioners who were not perhaps entirely disinterested upon the point were unanimous in recommending him to return to england he held on so long as he could but at last he developed nervous symptoms of a very pronounced character and so came back a broken man to his native county of wiltshire he bought a considerable estate with an ancient manor-house upon the edge of salisbury plain and devoted his old age to the study of comparative pathology which had been his learned hobby all of his life and in which he was a foremost authority we of the family were as may be imagined much excited by the news of the return of this rich and childless uncle to england on his part although by no means exuberant in his hospitality he showed some sense of his duty to his relations and each of us in turn had an invitation to visit him from the accounts of my cousins it appeared to be a melancholy business and it was with mixed feelings that i at last received my own summons to appear at rodenhurst my wife was so carefully excluded in the invitation that my first impulse was to refuse it but the interests of the children had to be considered and so with her consent i set out one october afternoon upon my visit to wiltshire with little thought of what that visit was to entail my uncle's estate was situated where the arable land of the plains begins to swell upwards into the rounded chalk hills which are characteristic of the county as i drove from denton station in the waning light of that autumn day i was impressed by the weird nature of the scenery the few scattered cottages of the peasants were so dwarfed by the huge evidences of prehistoric life that the present appeared to be a dream and the past to be the obtrusive and masterful reality the road wound through the valleys formed by a succession of grassy hills and the summit of each was cut and carved into the most elaborate fortifications some circular and some square but all on a scale which has defied the winds and the rains of many centuries some call them roman and some british but their true origin and the reasons for this particular tract of country being so interlaced with entrenchments have never been finally made clear here and there on the long smooth olive-coloured slopes there rose small rounded barrows or tumuli 
beneath them lie the cremated ashes of the race which cut so deeply into the hills but their graves tell us nothing save that a jar full of dust represents the man who once labored under the sun it was through this weird country that i approached my uncle's residence of rodenhurst and the house was as i found in due keeping with its surroundings two broken and weather-stained pillars each surmounted by a mutilated heraldic emblem flanked the entrance to a neglected drive a cold wind whistled through the elms which lined it and the air was full of the drifting leaves at the far end under the gloomy arch of trees a single yellow lamp burned steadily in the dim half-light of the coming night i saw a long low building stretching out two irregular wings with deep eaves a sloping gambrel roof and walls which were criss-crossed with timber bulks in the fashion of the tudors the cheery light of a fire flickered in the broad latticed window to the left of the low porched door and this as it proved marked the study of my uncle for it was thither that i was led by his butler in order to make my host's acquaintance he was cowering over his fire for the moist chill of an english autumn had set him shivering his lamp was unlit and i only saw the red glow of the embers beating upon a huge craggy face with a red indian nose and cheek and deep furrows and seams from eye to chin the sinister marks of hidden volcanic fires he sprang up at my entrance with something of an old-world courtesy and welcomed me warmly to rodenhurst at the same time i was conscious as the lamp was carried in that it was a very critical pair of light blue eyes which looked out at me from under shaggy eyebrows like scouts beneath a bush and that this outlandish uncle of mine was carefully reading off my character with all the ease of a practised observer and an experienced man of the world for my part i looked at him and looked again for i had never seen a man whose appearance was more fitted to hold one's attention his figure was the framework of a giant but he had fallen away his coat dangled straight down in a shocking fashion from a pair of broad and bony shoulders all his limbs were huge and yet emaciated and i could not take my gaze from his knobby wrists and long gnarled hands but his eyes those peering light blue eyes they were the most arrestive of any of his peculiarities it was not their color alone nor was it the ambush of hair in which they lurked but it was the expression which i read in them for the appearance and bearing of the man were masterful and one expected a certain corresponding arrogance in his eyes but instead of that i read the look which tells of a spirit cowed and crushed the furtive expectant look of the dog whose master has taken the whip from the rack i formed my own medical diagnosis upon one glance at those critical and yet appealing eyes i believed that he was stricken with some mortal ailment that he knew himself to be exposed to sudden death and that he lived in terror of it such was my judgment a false one as the event showed but i mention it that it may help you to realize the look which i read in his eyes my uncle's welcome was as i have said a courteous one and in an hour or so i found myself seated between him and his wife at a comfortable dinner with curious pungent delicacies upon the table and a stealthy quick-eyed oriental waiter behind his chair the old couple had come round to that tragic imitation of the dawn of life when husband and wife having lost or scattered all those who were their intimates find themselves face to face and alone once more their work done and the end nearing fast those who have reached that stage in sweetness and love who can change their winter into a gentle indian summer have come as victors through the ordeal of life lady holden was a small alert woman with a kindly eye and her expression as she glanced at him was a certificate of character to her husband and yet though i read a mutual love in their glances i read also a mutual horror and recognized in her face some reflection of that stealthy fear which i detected in his their talk was sometimes merry and sometimes sad but there was a forced note in their merriment and a naturalness in their sadness which told me that a heavy heart beat upon either side of me 
we were sitting over our first glass of wine and the servants had left the room when the conversation took a turn which produced a remarkable effect upon my host and hostess i cannot recall what it was which started the topic of the supernatural but it ended in my showing them that the abnormal in psychical experience was a subject to which i had like many neurologists devoted a great deal of attention i concluded by narrating my experiences when as a member of the psychical research society i had formed one of a committee of three who spent the night in a haunted house our adventures were neither exciting nor convincing but such as it was the story appeared to interest my auditors in a remarkable degree they listened with an eager silence and i caught a look of intelligence between them which i could not understand lady holden immediately afterwards rose and left the room sir dominic pushed the cigar-box over to me and we smoked for some little time in silence that huge bony hand of his was twitching as he raised it with his cheroot to his lips and i felt that the man's nerves were vibrating like fiddle-strings my instincts told me that he was on the verge of some intimate confidence and i feared to speak lest i should interrupt it at last he turned towards me with a spasmodic gesture like a man who throws his last scruple to the wind from the little that i have seen of you it appears to me dr hardacre said he that you are the very man i have wanted to meet i am delighted to hear it sir your head seems to be cool and steady you will acquit me of any desire to flatter you for the circumstances are too serious to permit of insincerities you have some special knowledge upon these subjects and you evidently view them from that philosophical standpoint which robs them of a vulgar terror i presume that the sight of an apparition would not seriously discompose you oh i think not sir would even interest you perhaps most intensely as a psychical observer you would probably investigate it in as impersonal a fashion as an astronomer investigates a wandering comet oh precisely he gave a heavy sigh believe me dr hardacre there was a time when i could have spoken as you do now my nerve was a byword in india even the mutiny never shook it for an instant and yet you see what i am reduced to the most timorous man perhaps in all this county of wiltshire do not speak too bravely upon this subject or you may find yourself subjected to as long drawn out a test as i am a test which can only end in the madhouse or the grave i waited patiently until he should see fit to go farther in his confidence his preamble had i need not say filled me with interest and expectation for some years dr hardacre he continued my life and that of my wife have been made miserable by a cause which is so grotesque that it borders upon the ludicrous and yet familiarity has never made it more easy to bear on the contrary as time passes my nerves become more worn and shattered by the constant attrition if you have no physical fears dr hardacre i should very much value your opinion upon this phenomenon which troubles us so for what it is worth my opinion is entirely at your service may i ask the nature of the phenomenon i think that your experiences will have a higher evidential value if you are not told in advance what you may expect to encounter you are yourself aware of the quibble of unconscious cerebration and subjective impressions with which a scientific sceptic may throw a doubt upon your statement it would be as well to guard against them in advance what shall i do then i will tell you would you mind following me this way he led me out of the dining-room and down a long passage until we came to a terminal door inside there was a large bare room fitted as a laboratory with numerous scientific instruments and bottles a shelf ran along one side and upon which there stood a long line of glass jars containing pathological and anatomical specimens you see that i still dabble in some of my old studies said sir dominic these jars are the remains of what was once a most excellent collection but unfortunately i lost the greater part of them when my house was burned down in bombay in ninety two it was a most unfortunate affair for me in more ways than one i had example of many rare conditions and my splenic collection was probably unique these are the survivors 
I glanced over them and saw that they really were of a very great value and rarity from a pathological point of view. Bloated organs, gaping cysts, distorted bones, odious parasites, a singular exhibition of the products of India. There is, as you see, a small settee here, said my host. It was far from our intention to offer a guest so meagre an accommodation, but since affairs have taken this turn, it would be a great kindness upon your part if you would consent to spend the night in this apartment. I beg that you will not hesitate to let me know if the idea should be at all repugnant to you. On the contrary, I said, it is most acceptable. My own room is the second on the left, so that if you should feel that you are in need of company, a call would always bring me to your side. I trust that I shall not be compelled to disturb you. It is unlikely that I shall be asleep. I do not sleep much. Do not hesitate to summon me. And so, with this agreement, we joined Lady Holden in the drawing-room and talked of lighter things. It was no affectation upon my part to say that the prospect of my night's adventure was an agreeable one. I have no pretense to greater physical courage than my neighbors, but familiarity with the subject robs it of those vague and undefined terrors which are the most appalling to the imaginative mind. The human brain is capable of only one strong emotion at a time, and if it be filled with curiosity or scientific enthusiasm, there is no room for fear. It is true that I had my uncle's assurance that he had himself originally taken this point of view, but I reflected that the breakdown of his nervous system might be due to his forty years in India as much as to any psychical experience which had befallen him. I at least was sound in nerve and brain, and it was with something of the pleasurable thrill of anticipation with which the sportsman takes his position beside the haunt of his game that I shut the laboratory door behind me, and partially undressing, lay down upon the rug-covered settee. It was not an ideal atmosphere for a bedroom, the air was heavy with many chemical odors, that of methylated spirit predominating. Nor were the decorations of my chamber very sedative. The odious line of glass jars with their relics of disease and suffering stretched in front of my very eyes. There was no blind to the window, and a three-quarter moon streamed its white light into the room, tracing a silver square with filigree lattices upon the opposite wall. When I had extinguished my candle, this one bright patch in the midst of the general gloom had certainly an eerie and discomposing aspect. A rigid and absolute silence reigned throughout the old house, so that the low swish of the branches in the garden came softly and soothingly to my ears. It may have been the hypnotic lullaby of this gentle susurrus, or it may have been the result of my tiring day, but after many dozings and many efforts to regain my clearness of perception, I fell at last into a deep and dreamless sleep. I was awakened by some sound in the room, and I instantly raised myself upon my elbow on the couch. Some hours had passed, for the square patch upon the wall had slid downwards and sideways until it lay obliquely at the end of my bed. The rest of the room was in deep shadow. At first I could see nothing. Presently, as my eyes became accustomed to the faint light, I was aware, with a thrill which all my scientific absorption could not entirely prevent, that something was moving slowly along the line of the wall. A gentle, shuffling sound, as of soft slippers, came to my ears, and I dimly discerned a human figure walking stealthily from the direction of the door. As it emerged into the patch of moonlight, I saw very clearly what it was and how it was employed. It was a man, short and squat, dressed in some sort of dark gray gown, which hung straight from his shoulders to his feet. The moon shone upon the side of his face, and I saw that it was chocolate brown in color, with a ball of black hair like a woman's at the back of his head. He walked slowly, and his eyes were cast upwards towards the line of bottles which contained those gruesome remnants of humanity. He seemed to examine each jar with attention, and then to pass on to the next. When he had come to the end of the line, immediately opposite my bed, he stopped, faced me, threw up his hands with a gesture of despair, and vanished from my sight. 
I have said that he threw up his hands, but I should have said his arms, for as he assumed that attitude of despair, I observed a singular peculiarity about his appearance. He had only one hand. As the sleeves drooped down from the upflung arm, I saw the left plainly, but the right ended in a knobby and unsightly stump. In every other way his appearance was so natural, and I had both seen and heard him so clearly, that I could easily have believed that he was an Indian servant of Sir Dominic's, who had come into my room in search of something. It was only his sudden disappearance which suggested anything more sinister to me. As it was, I sprang from my couch, lit a candle, and examined the whole room carefully. There were no signs of my visitor, and I was forced to conclude that there had really been something outside the normal laws of nature in his appearance. I lay awake for the remainder of the night, but nothing else occurred to disturb me. I am an early riser, but my uncle was an even earlier one, for I found him pacing up and down the lawn at the side of the house. He ran towards me in his eagerness when he saw me come out from the door. "'Well, well,' he cried, "'did you see him? An Indian with one hand?' "'Precisely. Yes, I saw him,' and I told him all that occurred. When I had finished, he led the way into his study. "'We have a little time before breakfast,' said he. "'It will suffice to give you an explanation of this extraordinary affair, so far as I can explain that which is essentially inexplicable.' In the first place, when I tell you that for four years I have never passed one single night, either in Bombay, aboard ship, or here in England, without my sleep being broken by this fellow, you will understand why it is that I am a wreck of my former self. His program is always the same. He appears by my bedside, shakes me roughly by the shoulder, passes from my room into the laboratory, walks slowly along the line of my bottles, and then vanishes. For more than a thousand times he has gone through the same routine. What does he want? He wants his hand. His hand? Yes, it came about in this way. I was summoned to Peshawar for a consultation some ten years ago, and while there I was asked to look at the hand of a native who was passing through with an Afghan caravan. The fellow came from some mountain tribe living away at the back of beyond, somewhere on the other side of Kafiristan. He talked a bastard Pashtu, and it was all I could do to understand him. He was suffering from a soft, sarcomatous swelling of one of the metacarpal joints, and I made him realize that it was only by losing his hand that he could hope to save his life. After much persuasion, he consented to the operation, and he asked me, when it was over, what fee I demanded. The poor fellow was almost a beggar, so that the idea of a fee was absurd, but I answered in jest that my fee should be his hand, and that I proposed to add it to my pathological collection. To my surprise, he demurred very much to the suggestion, and he explained that according to his religion it was an all-important matter that the body should be reunited after death, and so make a perfect dwelling for the spirit. The belief is, of course, an old one, and the mummies of the Egyptians arose from an analogous superstition. I answered him that his hand was already off, and asked him how he intended to preserve it. He replied that he would pickle it in salt and carry it about with him. I suggested that it might be safer in my keeping than in his, and that I had better means than salt for preserving it. On realizing that I really intended to carefully keep it, his opposition vanished instantly. "'But remember, Sahib,' said he, "'I shall want it back when I am dead.' I laughed at the remark, and so the matter ended. I returned to my practice, and he, no doubt, in the course of time, was able to continue his journey to Afghanistan. Well, as I told you last night, I had a bad fire in my house at Bombay. Half of it was burned down, and among other things, my pathological collection was largely destroyed. What you see are the poor remains of it. The hand of the hillman went with the rest, but I gave the matter no particular thought at the time. That was six years ago. Four years ago, two years after the fire, I was awakened one night by a furious tugging at my sleeve. I sat up under the impression that my favorite mastiff was trying to arouse me. Instead of this I saw my Indian patient of long ago, dressed in the long gray gown which is the badge of his people. 
He was holding up his stump and looked reproachfully at me. He then went over to my bottles, which at that time I kept in my room, and he examined them carefully, after which he gave a gesture of anger and vanished. I realized that he had just died, and that he had come to claim my promise that I should keep his limb in safety for him. Well, there you have it all, Dr. Hardacre. Every night, at the same hour, for four years, this performance has been repeated. It is a simple thing in itself, but it has worn me out like water dripping on a stone. It has brought a vile insomnia with it, for I cannot sleep now for the expectation of his coming. It has poisoned my old age and that of my wife, who has been the sharer in this great trouble. But there is the breakfast gong, and she will be waiting impatiently to know how it fared with you last night. We are both much indebted to you for your gallantry, for it takes something from the weight of our misfortune when we share it, even for a single night, with a friend, and it reassures us as to our sanity, which we are sometimes driven to question. This was the curious narrative which Sir Dominic confided to me, a story which to many would have appeared to be a grotesque impossibility, but which after my experience of the night before, and my previous knowledge of such things, I was prepared to accept as an absolute fact. I thought deeply over the matter, and brought the whole range of my reading and experience to bear upon it. After breakfast I surprised my host and hostess by announcing that I was returning to London by the next train. "'My dear doctor,' cried Sir Dominic, in great distress, "'you make me feel that I have been guilty of a gross breach of hospitality in intruding this unfortunate matter upon you. I should have borne my own burden.' "'It is indeed that matter which is taking me to London,' I answered. "'But you are mistaken, I assure you, if you think that my experience of last night was an unpleasant one to me.' On the contrary, I am about to ask your permission to return in the evening and spend one more night in your laboratory. I am very eager to see this visitor once again. My uncle was exceedingly anxious to know what I was about to do, but my fears of raising false hopes prevented me from telling him. I was back in my own consulting room a little after luncheon, and was confirming my memory of a passage in a recent book upon occultism which had arrested my attention when I read it. "'In the case of earthbound spirits,' said my authority, "'some one a dominant idea obsessing them at the hour of death is sufficient to hold them to this material world. They are the amphibia of this life and of the next.' capable of passing from one to the other as the turtle passes from land to water the causes which may bind a soul so strongly to a life which its body has abandoned are any violent emotion avarice revenge anxiety love and pity have all been known to have this effect as a rule it springs from some unfulfilled wish and when the wish has been fulfilled the material bond relaxes there are many cases upon record which show the singular persistence of these visitors and also their disappearance when their wishes have been fulfilled or in some cases when a reasonable compromise has been effected a reasonable compromise effected those were the words which i had brooded over all the morning and which i now verified in the original no actual atonement could be made here, but a reasonable compromise. I made my way as fast as a train could take me to the Shadwell Seaman's Hospital, where my old friend Jack Hewitt was house surgeon. Without explaining the situation, I made him understand exactly what it was that I wanted. "'A brown man's hand?' said he in amazement. "'What in the world do you want that for?' "'Never mind. I'll tell you some day. I know that your wards are full of Indians.' i should think so but a hand he thought a little and then struck a bell travers said he to a student dresser what became of the hands of the lascar which we took off yesterday i mean the fellow from the east india dock who got caught in the steam winch they are in the post-mortem room sir just pack one of them in antiseptics and give it to dr hardacre and so I found myself back at Rodenhurst before dinner with this curious outcome of my day in town. I still said nothing to Sir Dominic, but I slept that night in the laboratory, and I placed the Lascar's hand in one of the glass jars at the end of my couch. So interested was I in the result of my experiment that sleep was out of the question. 
I sat with a shaded lamp beside me and waited patiently for my visitor. This time I saw him clearly from the first. He appeared beside the door, nebulous for an instant, and then hardening into as distinct an outline as any living man. The slippers beneath his grey gown were red and heelless, which accounted for the low shuffling sound which he made as he walked. As on the previous night, he passed slowly along the line of bottles until he paused before that which contained the hand. He reached up to it, his whole figure quivering with expectation, took it down, examined it eagerly, and then, with a face which was convulsed with fury and disappointment, he hurled it down on the floor. There was a crash which resounded through the house, and when I looked up the mutilated Indian had disappeared. A moment later my door flew open, and Sir Dominic rushed in. "'You are not hurt?' he cried. "'No, but deeply disappointed.' He looked in astonishment at the splinters of glass and the brown hand lying upon the floor. "'Good God!' he cried. "'What is this?' I told him my idea and its wretched sequel. He listened intently, but shook his head. "'It was well thought of,' said he, "'but I fear that there is no such easy end to my sufferings. But one thing I now insist upon. It is that you shall never again upon any pretext occupy this room. My fears that something might have happened to you, when I heard that crash, have been the most acute of all the agonies which I have undergone. I will not expose myself to a repetition of it.' He allowed me, however, to spend the remainder of that night where I was, and I lay there worrying over the problem and lamenting my own failure. With the first light of morning there was the Lascar's hand still lying upon the floor to remind me of my fiasco. I lay looking at it, and as I lay suddenly an idea flew like a bullet through my head and brought me quivering with excitement out of my couch. I raised the grim relic from where it had fallen. Yes, it was indeed so. The hand was the left hand of the Lascar. By the first train I was on my way to town and hurried at once to the seaman's hospital. I remembered that both hands of the Lascar had been amputated, but I was terrified lest the precious organ which I was in search of might have been already consumed in the crematory. My suspense was soon ended. It had still been preserved in the post-mortem room and so I returned to Roddenhurst in the evening with my mission accomplished, and the material for a fresh experiment. But Sir Dominic Holden would not hear of my occupying the laboratory again. To all my entreaties he turned a deaf ear. It offended his sense of hospitality, and he could no longer permit it. I left the hand, therefore, as I had done its fellow the night before, and I occupied a comfortable bedroom in another portion of the house, some distance from the scene of my adventures. But in spite of that my sleep was not destined to be uninterrupted. In the dead of night my host burst into my room, a lamp in his hand. His huge gaunt figure was enveloped in a loose dressing-gown, and his whole appearance might certainly have seemed more formidable to a weak-nerved man than that of the Indian of the night before but it was not his entrance so much as his expression which amazed me. He had turned suddenly younger by twenty years at the least. His eyes were shining, his features radiant, and he waved one hand in triumph over his head. I sat up, astounded, staring sleepily at this extraordinary visitor, but his words soon drove the sleep from my eyes. "'We have done it! We have succeeded!' he shouted. "'My dear Hardacre, how can I ever in this world repay you?' "'You don't mean to say that it is all right?' "'Indeed I do. I was sure that you would not mind being awakened to hear such blessed news. Mind? I should think not indeed, but is it really certain? I have no doubt whatever upon the point. I owe you such a debt, my dear nephew, as I have never owed a man before, and never expected to. What can I possibly do for you that is commensurate? Providence must have sent you to my rescue.' You have saved both my reason and my life, for another six months of this must have seen me either in a cell or a coffin. And my wife, it was wearing her out before my eyes. Never could I have believed that any human being could have lifted this burden off me. He seized my hand and wrung it in his bony grip. It was only an experiment, a forlorn hope, but I am delighted from my heart that it has succeeded. But how do you know that it is all right? Have you seen something? He seated himself at the foot of my bed. 
I have seen enough, said he. It satisfies me that I shall be troubled no more. What has passed is easily told. You know that at a certain hour this creature always comes to me. Tonight he arrived at the usual time and aroused me with even more violence than is his custom. I can only surmise that his disappointment of last night increased the bitterness of his anger against me. He looked angrily at me and then went on his usual round. But in a few minutes I saw him, for the first time since this persecution began, return to my chamber. He was smiling. I saw the gleam of his white teeth through the dim light. He stood facing me at the end of my bed, and three times he made the low eastern salaam which is their solemn leave-taking. And the third time that he bowed, he raised his arms over his head, and I saw his two hands outstretched in the air. So he vanished, and as I believe, forever. So that is the curious experience which won me the affection and the gratitude of my celebrated uncle, the famous Indian surgeon. His anticipations were realized, and never again was he disturbed by the visits of the restless hillman in search of his lost member. Sir Dominic and Lady Holden spent a very happy old age, unclouded, so far as I know, by any trouble, and they finally died during the great influenza epidemic within a few weeks of each other. In his lifetime he always turned to me for advice in everything which concerned that English life of which he knew so little, and I aided him also in the purchase and development of his estates. It was no great surprise to me, therefore, that I found myself eventually promoted over the heads of five exasperated cousins, and changed in a single day from a hard-working country doctor into the head of an important Wiltshire family. I at least have reason to bless the memory of the man with the brown hand, and the day when I was fortunate enough to relieve Rodenhurst of his unwelcome presence. End of Story 14 Story 15 of Round the Fire Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 15 The Fiend of the Cooperage. It was no easy matter to bring the gamecock up to the island, for the river had swept down so much silt that the banks extended for many miles out into the Atlantic. The coast was hardly to be seen when the first white curl of the breakers warned us of our danger and from there onwards we made our way very carefully under mainsail and jib keeping the broken water well to the left as is indicated on the chart more than once her bottom touched the sand we were drawing something under six feet at the time but we always had way enough and luck enough to carry us through finally the water shoaled very rapidly but they had sent a canoe from the factory and the crew-boy pilot brought us within two hundred yards of the island here we dropped our anchor for the gestures of the negro indicated that we could not hope to get any farther the blue of the sea had changed to the brown of the river and even under the shelter of the island the current was singing and swirling round our bows the stream appeared to be in spate for it was over the roots of the palm trees and everywhere upon its muddy greasy surface we could see logs of wood and debris of all sorts which had been carried down by the flood when i had assured myself that we swung securely at our moorings i thought it best to begin watering at once for the place looked as if it reeked with fever the heavy river, the muddy shining banks, the bright poisonous green of the jungle, the moist steam in the air, they were all so many danger signals to one who could read them. I sent the longboat off, therefore, with two large hogsheads, which should be sufficient to last us until we made St. Paul de la Wanda. For my own part I took the dinghy and rowed for the island, for I could see the Union Jack fluttering above the palms to mark the position of Armitage and Wilson's trading station. When I had cleared the grove I could see the place, a long, low, whitewashed building, with a deep veranda in front, and an immense pile of palm oil barrows heaped upon either flank of it. A row of surf boats and canoes lay along the beach, and a single small jetty projected into the river. 
two men in white suits with red cummerbunds round their waists were waiting upon the end of it to receive me one was a large portly fellow with a greyish beard the other was slender and tall with a pale pinched face which was half concealed by a great mushroom-shaped hat very glad to see you said the latter cordially i am walker the agent of armitage and wilson let me introduce dr severall of the same company it is not often we see a private yacht in these parts she's the gamecock i explained i'm owner and captain meldrum is the name exploring he asked i'm a lepidopterist a butterfly catcher i've been doing the west coast from senegal downwards good sport asked the doctor turning a slow yellow shot eye upon me i have forty cases full we came in here to water and also to see what you have in my line these introductions and explanations had filled up the time whilst my two crew boys were making the dinghy fast then i walked down the jetty with one of my new acquaintances upon either side each plying me with questions for they had seen no white man for months what do we do said the doctor when i had begun asking questions in my turn our business keeps us pretty busy and in our leisure time we talk politics yes by the special mercy of providence severall is a rank radical and i am a good stiff unionist and we talk home rule for two solid hours every evening and drink quinine cocktails said the doctor we're both pretty well salted now but our normal temperature was about a hundred and three last year i shouldn't as an impartial adviser recommend you to stay here very long unless you are collecting bacilli as well as butterflies the mouth of the ogowai river will never develop into a health resort there is nothing finer than the way in which these outlying pickets of civilization distill a grim humor out of their desolate situation and turn not only a bold but a laughing face upon the chances which their lives may bring everywhere from sierra leone downwards i had found the same reeking swamps the same isolated fever-racked communities and the same bad jokes there is something approaching to the divine in that power of man to rise above his conditions and to use his mind for the purpose of mocking at the miseries of his body dinner will be ready in about half an hour captain meldrum said the doctor walker has gone in to see about it he's the housekeeper this week meanwhile if you like we'll stroll round and i'll show you the sights of the island the sun had already sunk beneath the line of palm trees and the great arch of the heaven above our head was like the inside of a huge shell shimmering with dainty pinks and delicate iridescence no one who has not lived in a land where the weight and heat of a napkin become intolerable upon the knees can imagine the blessed relief which the coolness of evening brings along with it in this sweeter and purer air the doctor and i walked round the little island he pointing out the stores and explaining the routine of his work there's a certain romance about the place said he in answer to some remark of mine about the dullness of their lives we are living here just upon the edge of the great unknown up there he continued pointing to the northeast du chalot penetrated and found the home of the gorilla that is the gaboon country the land of the great apes in this direction pointing to the southeast no one has been very far the land which is drained by this river is practically unknown to europeans every log which is carried past us by the current has come from an undiscovered country i've often wished that i was a better botanist when i have seen the singular orchids and curious-looking plants which have been cast up on the eastern end of the island the place which the doctor indicated was a sloping brown beach freely littered with the flotsam of the stream at each end was a curved point like a little natural breakwater so that a small shallow bay was left between this was full of floating vegetation with a single huge splintered tree lying stranded in the middle of it the current rippling against its high black side these are all from up country said the doctor they get caught in our little bay and then when some extra freshet comes they are washed out again and carried out to sea what is the tree i asked oh some kind of teak i should imagine but pretty rotten by the look of it we get all sorts of big hardwood trees floating past here to say nothing of the palms just come in here will you 
he led the way into a long building with an immense quantity of barrel staves and iron hoops littered about in it this is our cooperage said he we have the staves sent out in bundles and we put them together ourselves now you don't see anything particularly sinister about this building do you i looked round at the high corrugated iron roof the white wooden walls and the earthen floor in one corner lay a mattress and a blanket i see nothing very alarming said i and yet there's something out of the common too he remarked you see that bed well i intend to sleep there to-night i don't want to buck but i think it's a bit of a test for nerve why oh there have been some funny goings on you were talking about the monotony of our lives but i assure you that they are sometimes quite as exciting as we wish them to be you'd better come back to the house now for after sundown we begin to get the fever fog up from the marshes there you can see it coming across the river i looked and saw long tentacles of white vapour writhing out from among the thick green underwood and crawling at us over the broad swirling surface of the brown river at the same time the air turned suddenly dank and cold there's the dinner gong said the doctor if this matter interests you i'll tell you about it afterwards it did interest me very much for there was something earnest and subdued in his manner as he stood in the empty cooperage which appealed very forcibly to my imagination he was a big bluff hearty man this doctor and yet i had detected a curious expression in his eyes as he glanced about him an expression which i would not describe as one of fear but rather that of a man who is alert and on his guard by the way said i as we returned to the house you have shown me the huts of a good many of your native assistants but i have not seen any of the natives themselves they sleep in the hulk over yonder the doctor answered pointing over to one of the banks indeed i should not have thought in that case that they would need the huts oh they used the huts until quite recently we've put them on the hulk until they recover their confidence a little they were all half mad with fright so we let them go and nobody sleeps on the island except walker and myself what frightened them i asked well that brings us back to the same story i suppose walker has no objection to your hearing all about it i don't know why we should make any secret about it though it is certainly a pretty bad business he made no further allusion to it during the excellent dinner which had been prepared in my honour it appeared that no sooner had the little white topsail of the gamecock shown round cape lopez than these kind fellows had begun to prepare their famous pepper-pot which is the pungent stew peculiar to the west coast and to boil their yams and sweet potatoes we sat down to as good a native dinner as one could wish served by a smart sierra leone waiting-boy i was just remarking to myself that he at least had not shared in the general flight when having laid the dessert and wine upon the table he raised his hands to his turban anything else i do massa walker he asked no i think that is all right musa my host answered i am not feeling very well to-night though and i should much prefer if you would stay on the island i saw a struggle between his fears and his duty upon the swarthy face of the african his skin had turned of that livid purplish tint which stands for pallor in a negro and his eyes looked furtively about him no no massa waka he cried at last you better come to the hulk with me sa look after you much better in the hulk sa that won't do musa white men don't run away from the posts where they are placed again i saw the passionate struggle in the negro's face and again his fears prevailed no use massa waka sir he cried so help me i can't do it if it was yesterday if it was to-morrow but this is the third night sir and it's more than i can face walker shrugged his shoulders off with you then said he when the mail-boat comes you can get back to sierra leone for i'll have no servant who deserts me when i need him most i suppose this is all mystery to you or has the doctor told you captain meldrum i showed captain meldrum the cooperage but i did not tell him anything said dr severall you're looking bad walker he added glancing at his companion you have a strong touch coming on you yes i've had the shivers all day and now my head is like a cannonball. i took ten grains of quinine and my ears are singing like a kettle 
but i want to sleep with you in the cooperage to-night no no my dear chap i won't hear of such a thing you must go to bed at once and i am sure meldrum will excuse you i shall sleep in the cooperage and i promise you that i'll be around with your medicine before breakfast it was evident that walker had been struck by one of those sudden and violent attacks of remittent fever which are the curse of the west coast his sallow cheeks were flushed and his eyes shining with fever and suddenly as he sat there he began to croon out a song in the high-pitched voice of delirium come come we must get you to bed old chap said the doctor and with my aid he led his friend into his bedroom there we undressed him and presently after taking a strong sedative he settled down into a deep slumber he's right for the night said the doctor as we sat down and filled our glasses once more sometimes it is my turn and sometimes his but fortunately we have never been down together i should have been sorry to be out of it to-night for i have a little mystery to unravel i told you that i intended to sleep in the cooperage yes you said so when i said sleep i meant watch for there will be no sleep for me we've had such a scare here that no native will stay after sundown and i mean to find out to-night what the cause of it all may be it has always been the custom for a native watchman to sleep in the cooperage to prevent the barrel hoops being stolen well six days ago the fellow who slept there disappeared and we have never seen a trace of him since it was certainly singular for no canoe had been taken and these waters are too full of crocodiles for any man to swim to shore what became of the fellow or how he could have left the island is a complete mystery walker and i were merely surprised but the blacks were badly scared and queer voodoo tales began to get around amongst them but the real stampede broke out three nights ago when the new watchman in the cooperage also disappeared what became of him i asked well we not only don't know but we can't even give a guess which would fit the facts the niggers swear there is a fiend in the cooperage who claims a man every third night they wouldn't stay in the island nothing could persuade them even musa who is a faithful boy enough would as you have seen leave his master in a fever rather than remain for the night if we are to continue to run this place we must reassure our niggers and i don't know any better way of doing it than by putting in a night there myself this is the third night you see so i suppose the thing is due whatever it may be have you no clue i asked was there no mark of violence no blood stain no footprints nothing to give a hint as to what kind of danger you may have to meet absolutely nothing the man was gone and that was all last time it was old ali who had been wharf tender here since the place was started he was always as steady as a rock and nothing but foul play could take him from his work well said i i really don't think that this is a one-man job your friend is full of laudanum and come what might he can be of no assistance to you you must let me stay and put in a night with you at the cooperage well now that's very good of you meldrum said he heartily shaking my hand across the table it's not a thing that i should have ventured to propose for it is asking a good deal of a casual visitor but if you really mean it oh certainly i mean it if you will excuse me a moment i will hail the gamecock and let them know that they need not expect me as we came back from the other end of the little jetty we were both struck by the appearance of the night a huge blue-black pile of clouds had built itself up upon the landward side and the wind came from it in little hot pants which beat upon our faces like the draught from a blast furnace under the jetty the river was swirling and hissing tossing little white spurts of spray over the planking confound it said dr severall we are likely to have a flood on the top of all our troubles that rise in the river means heavy rain up country and when it once begins you never know how far it will go we've had the island nearly covered before now well we'll just go and see that walker is comfortable and then if you like we'll settle down in our quarters the sick man was sunk in a profound slumber and we left him with some crushed limes in a glass beside him in case he should wake with the thirst of fever upon him then we made our way through the unnatural gloom thrown by that menacing cloud 
The river had risen so high that the little bay which I have described at the end of the island had become almost obliterated through the submerging of its flanking peninsula. The great raft of driftwood, with the huge black tree in the middle, was swaying up and down in the swollen current. "'That's one good thing a flood will do for us,' said the doctor. "'It carries away all the vegetable stuff which is brought down on to the east end of the island. It came down with the freshet the other day, and here it will stay until a flood sweeps it out into the main stream. Well, here's our room, and here are some books, and here is my tobacco pouch, and we must try and put in the night as best we may. By the light of our single lantern, the great lonely room looked very gaunt and dreary. Save for the piles of staves and heaps of hoops, there was absolutely nothing in it, with the exception of the mattress for the doctor, which had been laid in the corner. We made a couple of seats and a table out of the staves, and settled down together for a long vigil. Severall had brought a revolver for me, and was himself armed with a double-barreled shotgun. We loaded our weapons and laid them cocked within reach of our hands. The little circle of light and the black shadows arching over us were so melancholy that he went off to the house and returned with two candles. One side of the cooperage was pierced, however, by several open windows, and it was only by screening our lights behind staves that we could prevent them from being extinguished. The doctor, who appeared to be a man of iron nerves, had settled down to a book, but I observed that every now and then he laid it upon his knee and took an earnest look all around him. For my part, although I tried once or twice to read, I found it impossible to concentrate my thoughts upon the book. They would always wander back to this great empty silent room and to the sinister mystery which overshadowed it. I racked my brains for some possible theory which would explain the disappearance of these two men. There was the black fact that they were gone, and not the least tittle of evidence as to why or whither. And here we were waiting in the same place, waiting without an idea as to what we were waiting for. I was right in saying that it was not a one-man job. It was trying enough as it was, but no force upon earth would have kept me there without a comrade. What an endless, tedious night it was! Outside we heard the lapping and gurgling of the great river, and the soughing of the rising wind. Within, save for our breathing, the turning of the doctor's pages, and the high shrill ping of an occasional mosquito, there was a heavy silence. Once my heart sprang into my mouth as Severall's book suddenly fell to the ground, and he sprang to his feet with his eyes on one of the windows. "'Did you see anything, Meldrum?' "'No, did you?' "'Well, I had a vague sense of movement outside that window.' He caught up his gun and approached it. "'No, there's nothing to be seen, and yet I could have sworn that something passed slowly across it. "'A palm-leaf, perhaps,' said I, for the wind was growing stronger every instant. "'Very likely,' said he, and settled down to his book again, but his eyes were forever darting little suspicious glances up at the window.' I watched it also, but all was quiet outside. And then, suddenly, our thoughts were turned into a new direction by the bursting of the storm. A blinding flash was followed by a clap which shook the building. Again and again came the vivid white glare with thunder at the same instant, like the flash and roar of a monstrous piece of artillery. And then down came the tropical rain crashing and rattling on the corrugated iron roofing of the cooperage. The big hollow room boomed like a drum. From the darkness arose a strange mixture of noises, a gurgling, splashing, tinkling, bubbling, washing, dripping, every liquid sound that nature can produce from the thrashing and swirshing of the rain to the deep, steady boom of the river. Hour after hour the uproar grew louder and more sustained. "'My word!' said Severall. "'We are going to have the father of all the floods this time. "'Well, here's the dawn coming at last, and that is a blessing. "'We've about exploded the third night superstition anyhow.' "'A grey light was stealing through the room, "'and there was the day upon us in an instant. "'The rain had eased off, but the coffee-coloured river "'was roaring past like a waterfall. "'Its power made me fear for the anchor of the gamecock. 
"'I must get aboard,' said I. "'If she drags, she'll never be able to beat up the river again.' "'The island is as good as a breakwater,' the doctor answered. "'I can give you a cup of coffee if you will come up to the house.' I was chilled and miserable, so the suggestion was a welcome one. We left the ill-omened cooperage with its mystery still unsolved, and we splashed our way up to the house. "'There's the spirit lamp,' said Severall. "'If you would just put a light to it, I will see how Walker feels this morning.' He left me, but was back in an instant with a dreadful face. "'He's gone!' he cried hoarsely. The words sent a thrill of horror through me. I stood with the lamp in my hand, glaring at him. "'Yes, he's gone!' he repeated. "'Come and look!' I followed him without a word, and the first thing that I saw as I entered the bedroom was Walker himself lying huddled on his bed in the grey flannel sleeping suit in which I had helped to dress him on the night before. "'Not dead, surely,' I gasped. The doctor was terribly agitated. His hands were shaking like leaves in the wind. "'He's been dead some hours.' was it fever fever look at his foot i glanced down and a cry of horror burst from my lips one foot was not merely dislocated but was turned completely round in a most grotesque contortion good god i cried what can have done this several had laid his hand upon the dead man's chest feel here he whispered i placed my hand at the same spot there was no resistance the body was absolutely soft and limp. It was like pressing a sawdust doll. "'The breastbone is gone,' said Severall in the same odd whisper. "'He's broken to bits. Thank God that he had the laudanum. You can see by his face that he died in his sleep. But who can have done this?' "'I've had about as much as I can stand,' said the doctor, wiping his forehead. "'I don't know that I'm a greater coward than my neighbors, but this gets beyond me.' If you're going out to the gamecock, come on, said I, and off we started. If we did not run, it was because each of us wished to keep up the last shadow of his self-respect before the other. It was dangerous in a light canoe on that swollen river, but we never paused to give the matter a thought. He bailing and I paddling, we kept her above water and gained the deck of the yacht. There, with two hundred yards of water between us and this cursed island, we felt that we were our own men once more. "'We'll go back in an hour or so,' said he, "'but we need a little time to steady ourselves. I wouldn't have had the niggers see me as I was just now for a year's salary. I've told the steward to prepare breakfast. Then we shall go back,' said I. "'But in God's name, Dr. Severall, what do you make of it all?' "'It beats me. Beats me clean.' I've heard of voodoo devilry, and I've laughed at it with the others, but that poor old Walker, a decent, God-fearing, nineteenth-century, Primrose League Englishman, should go under like this without a whole bone in his body? It's given me a shake. I won't deny it. But look here, Meldrum, is that hand of yours mad or drunk, or what is it? old patterson the oldest man of my crew and as steady as the pyramids had been stationed in the bows with a boat hook to fend off the drifting logs which came sweeping down with the current now he stood with crooked knees glaring out in front of him and one forefinger stabbing furiously at the air look at it he yelled look at it and at the same instant we saw it a huge black tree trunk was coming down the river, its broad glistening back just lapped by the water, and in front of it, about three feet in front, arching upwards like the figurehead of a ship, there hung a dreadful face, swaying slowly from side to side. It was flattened, malignant, as large as a small beer barrel, of a faded fungoid color, but the neck which supported it was mottled with a dull yellow and black. As it flew past the gamecock in the swirl of the waters, I saw two immense coils roll up out of some great hollow in the tree, and the villainous head rose suddenly to the height of eight or ten feet, looking with dull, skin-covered eyes at the yacht. An instant later the tree had shot past us, and was plunging with its horrible passenger towards the Atlantic. "'What was it?' I cried. "'It is our fiend of the cooperage,' said Dr. Severall, and he had become in an instant the same bluff, self-confident man that he had been before. 
yes that is the devil who has been haunting our island it is the great python of the gaboon i thought of the stories which i had heard all down the coast of the monstrous constrictors of the interior of their periodical appetite and of the murderous effects of their deadly squeeze then it took shape in my mind there had been a freshet the week before it had brought down this huge hollow tree with its hideous occupant who knows from what far distant tropical forest it may have come it had been stranded on the little east bay of the island the cooperage had been the nearest house twice with the return of its appetite it had carried off the watchman last night it had doubtless come again when severall had thought he saw something move at the window but our lights had driven it away it had writhed onwards and had slain poor walker in his sleep why did it not carry him off i asked the thunder and lightning must have scared the brute away there's your steward meldrum the sooner we have breakfast and get back to the island the better or some of those niggers might think that we had been frightened End of story 15story sixteen of round the fire stories by arthur conan doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain story sixteen jelland's voyage well said our anglo jap as we all drew up our chairs round the smoking-room fire it's an old tale out yonder and may have spilt over into print for all i know i don't want to turn this club-room into a chestnut stall but it is a long way to the yellow sea and it is just as likely that none of you have ever heard of the yawl matilda and of what happened to henry jelland and willie mcavoy aboard of her the middle of the sixties was a stirring time out in japan that was just after the Saki bombardment and before the daimo affair there was a tory party and there was a liberal party among the natives and the question that they were wrangling over was whether the throats of the foreigners should be cut or not i tell you all politics have been tame to me since then if you lived in a treaty port you were bound to wake up and take an interest in them and to make it better the outsider had no way of knowing how the game was going if the opposition won it would not be a newspaper paragraph that would tell him of it but a good old tory in a suit of chain mail with a sword in each hand would drop in and let him know all about it in a single upper cut of course it makes men reckless when they are living on the edge of a volcano like that just at first they are very jumpy and then there comes a time when they learn to enjoy life while they have it i tell you there's nothing makes life so beautiful as when the shadow of death begins to fall across it time is too precious to be dawdled away then and a man lives every minute of it that was the way with us in yokohama there were many european places of business which had to go on running and the men who worked them made the place lively for seven nights in the week one of the heads of the european colony was randolph moore the big export merchant his offices were in yokohama but he spent a good deal of his time at his house up in jetto which had only just been opened to the trade in his absence he used to leave his affairs in the hands of his head clerk jelland whom he knew to be a man of great energy and resolution but energy and resolution were two-edged things you know and when they are used against you you don't appreciate them so much it was gambling that set jelland wrong he was a little dark-eyed fellow with black curly hair more than three-quarters celt i would imagine every night in the week you would see him in the same place on the left-hand side of the croupier at matheson's rouge et noir table for a long time he won and lived in better style than his employer and then came a turn of luck and he began to lose so that at the end of a single week his partner and he were stone broke without a dollar to their name this partner was a clerk in the employ of the same firm a tall straw-haired young englishman called mcavoy he was a good boy enough at the start but he was clay in the hands of jelland who fashioned him into a kind of weak model of himself they were forever on the prowl together but it was jelland who led and mcavoy who followed lynch and i and one or two others tried to show the youngster that he could come to no good along that line and when we were talking to him we could win him round easily enough 
but five minutes of gelling would swing him back again it may have been animal magnetism or what you like but the little man could pull the big one along like a sixty-foot tug in front of a full-rigged ship even when they had lost all their money they would still take their place at the table and look on with shining eyes when anyone else was raking in the stamps but one evening they could keep out of it no longer red had turned up sixteen times running and it was more than jelland could bear he whispered to mcavoy and then said a word to the croupier certainly mr jelland your check is as good as notes said he jelland scribbled a check and threw it on the black the card was the king of hearts and the croupier raked in the little bit of paper jelland grew angry and mcavoy white another and a heavier check was written and thrown on the table the card was the nine of diamonds mcavoy leaned his head upon his hands and looked as if he would faint by god growled jelland i won't be beat and he threw on a check that covered the other two the card was the deuce of hearts a few minutes later they were walking down the bunt with the cool night air playing upon their fevered faces of course you know what this means said jelland lighting a cheroot we'll have to transfer some of the office money to our current account there's no occasion to make a fuss over it old moore won't look over the books before easter if we have any luck we can easily replace it before then but if we have no luck faltered mcavoy tut man we must take things as they come you stick to me and i'll stick to you and we'll pull through together you shall sign the checks to-morrow night and we shall see if your luck is better than mine but if anything it was worse when the pair rose from the table on the following evening they had spent over five thousand pounds of their employer's money but the resolute jelland was as sanguine as ever we have a good nine weeks before us before the books will be examined said he we must play the game out and it will all come straight mcavoy returned to his rooms that night in an agony of shame and remorse when he was with jelland he borrowed strength from him but alone he recognized the full danger of his position and the vision of his old white-capped mother in england who had been so proud when he had received his appointment rose up before him to fill him with loathing and madness he was still tossing about his sleepless couch when his japanese servant entered the bedroom for an instant mcavoy thought that the long-expected outbreak had come and plunged for his revolver then with his heart in his mouth he listened to the message which the servant had brought jelland was downstairs and wanted to see him what on earth could he want at that hour of night mcavoy dressed hurriedly and rushed downstairs his companion with a set smile upon his lips which was belied by the ghastly pallor of his face was sitting in the dim light of a solitary candle with a slip of paper in his hands sorry to knock you up willie said he no eavesdroppers i suppose mcavoy shook his head he could not trust himself to speak well then our little game is played out this note was waiting for me at home it is from moore and says that he will be down on monday morning for an examination of the books it leaves us in a tight place monday gasped mcavoy today is friday saturday my son and three a m we have not much time to turn round in we are lost screamed mcavoy we soon will be if you make such an infernal row said jelland harshly now do what i tell you willie and we'll pull through yet i will do anything anything that's better where's your whisky it's a beastly time of the day to have to get your back stiff but there must be no softness with us or we are gone first of all i think there is something due to our relations don't you mcavoy stared we must stand or fall together you know now i for one don't intend to set my foot inside a felon stock under any circumstances do you see i'm ready to swear to that are you what do you mean asked mcavoy shrinking back why man we all have to die and it's only the pressing of a trigger i swear that i shall never be taken alive will you if you don't i leave you to your fate all right i'll do whatever you think best you swear it yes well mind you must be as good as your word now we have two clear days to get off in 
the yawl matilda is on sale and she has all her fixings and plenty of tin stuff aboard we'll buy the lot to-morrow morning and whatever we want and get away in her but first we'll clear all that is left in the office there are five thousand sovereigns in the safe after dark we'll get them aboard the yawl and take our chance of reaching california there's no use hesitating my son for we have no ghost of a look-in in any other direction it's that or nothing i'll do what you advise all right and mind you get a bright face on you to-morrow for if moore gets the tip and comes before monday then he tapped the side pocket of his coat and looked across at his partner with eyes that were full of a sinister meaning all went well with their plans next day the matilda was bought without difficulty and though she was a tiny craft for so long a voyage had she been larger two men would not have hoped to manage her she was stocked with water during the day and after dark the two clerks brought down the money from the office and stowed it in the hold before midnight they had collected all their own possessions without exciting suspicion and at two in the morning they left their moorings and stole quietly out from among the shipping they were seen of course and were set down as keen yachtsmen who were on for a good long sunday cruise but there was no one who dreamed that that cruise would only end either on the american coast or at the bottom of the north pacific ocean straining and hauling they got their mainsail up and set their foresail and jib there was a slight breeze from the southeast and the little craft went dipping along upon her way seven miles out from land however the wind fell away and they lay becalmed rising and falling on the long swell of a glassy sea all sunday they did not make a mile and in the evening yokohama still lay along the horizon on monday morning down came randolph moore from jeddo and made straight for the office he had had the tip from some one that his clerks had been spreading themselves a bit and that had made him come down out of his usual routine but when he reached his place and found the three juniors waiting in the street with their hands in their pockets he knew that the matter was serious what's this he asked he was a man of action and a nasty chap to deal with when he had his topmast lowered we can't get in said the clerks where is mr jelland he has not come to-day and mr mcavoy he has not come either randolph moore looked serious we must have the door down said he they don't build houses very solid in that land of earthquakes and in a brace of shakes they were all in the office of course the thing told its own story the safe was open the money gone and the clerks fled their employer lost no time in talk where were they seen last on saturday they bought the matilda and started for a cruise saturday the matter seemed hopeless if they had got two days start but there was still the shadow of a chance he rushed to the beach and swept the ocean with his glasses my god he cried there's the matilda out yonder i know her by the rake of her mast i have my hand upon the villains after all but there was a hitch even then no boat had steam up and the eager merchant had not patience to wait clouds were banking up along the haunch of the hills and there was every sign of an approaching change of weather a police boat was ready with ten armed men in her and randolph moore himself took the tiller as she sought out in pursuit of the becalmed yawl jelland and mcavoy waiting wearily for the breeze which never came saw the dark speck which sprang out from the shadow of the land and grew larger with every swish of the oars as she drew nearer they could see also that she was packed with men and the gleam of weapons told what manner of men they were jelland stood leaning against the tiller and he looked at the threatening sky the limp sails and the approaching boat it's a case with us willie said he by the lord we are two most unlucky devils for there's wind in that sky and another hour would have brought it to us mcavoy groaned there's no good softening over it my lad said jelland it's the police boat right enough and there's old moore driving them to row like hell it'll be a ten dollar job for every man of them willie mcavoy crouched against the side with his knees on the deck my mother my poor old mother he sobbed she'll never hear that you have been in the dock anyway said jelland my people never did much for me but i will do that much for them it's no good mac we can chuck our hands god bless you old man 
here's the pistol he cocked the revolver and held the butt towards the youngster but the other shrunk away from it with little gasps and cries jelland glanced at the approaching boat it was not more than a few hundred yards away there's no time for nonsense said he damn it man what's the use of flinching you swore it no no jelland well anyhow i swore that neither of us would be taken will you do it i can't i can't then i will for you the rowers in the boat saw him lean forwards they heard two pistol shots they saw him double himself across the tiller and then before the smoke had lifted they found that they had something else to think of for at that instant the storm broke one of those short sudden squalls which are common in these seas the matilda heeled over her sails bellied out she plunged her lee rail into a wave and was off like a frightened deer jelland's body had jammed the helm and she kept a course right before the wind and fluttered away over the rising sea like a blown piece of paper the rowers worked frantically but the yawl still drew ahead and in five minutes it had plunged into the storm rack never to be seen again by mortal eye the boat put back and reached yokohama with the water washing halfway up the thwarts and that was how it came out that the yawl matilda with a cargo of five thousand pounds and a crew of two dead young men set sail across the pacific ocean what the end of jelland's voyage may have been no man knows he may have foundered in that gale or he may have been picked up by some canny merchantman who stuck to the bullion and kept his mouth shut or he may still be cruising in that vast waste of water blown north to the bering sea or south to the malay islands it's better to leave it unfinished than to spoil a true story by inventing a tag to it End of story sixteen story seventeen of round the fire stories by arthur conan doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain story seventeen b dot twenty four i told my story when i was taken and no one would listen to me then i told it again at the trial the whole thing absolutely as it happened without so much as a word added i said it all out truly so help me god all that lady mannering said and did and then all that i had said and done just as it occurred and what did i get for it the prisoner put forward a rambling and inconsequential statement incredible in its details and unsupported by any shred of corroborative evidence that was what one of the london papers said and others let it pass as if i had made no defence at all and yet with my own eyes i saw lord mannering murdered and i am as guiltless of it as any man in the jury that tried me now sir you are there to receive the petitions of prisoners it all lies with you all i ask is that you read it just read it and then that you make an inquiry or two about the private character of this lady mannering if she still keeps the name that she had three years ago when to my sorrow and ruin i came to meet her you could use a private inquiry agent or a good lawyer and you would soon learn enough to show you that my story is the true one think of the glory it would be to you to have all the papers saying that there would have been a shocking miscarriage of justice if it had not been for your perseverance and intelligence that must be your reward since i am a poor man and can offer you nothing but if you don't do it may you never lie easy in your bed again may no night pass that you are not haunted by the thought of the man who rots in jail because you have not done the duty which you are paid to do but you will do it sir i know just make one or two inquiries and you will soon find which way the wind blows remember also that the only person who profited by the crime was herself since it changed her from an unhappy wife to a rich young widow there's the end of the string in your hand and you only have to follow it up and see where it leads to mind you sir i make no complaint as far as the burglary goes i don't whine about what i have deserved and so far i have had no more than i have deserved burglary it was right enough and my three years have gone to pay for it 
It was shown at the trial that I had had a hand in the Merton Cross business and did a year for that, so my story had the less attention on that account. A man with a previous conviction never gets a really fair trial. I own to the burglary, but when it comes to the murder which brought me a lifer, any judge but Sir James might have given me the gallows, then I tell you that I had nothing to do with it and that I am an innocent man. And now I'll take that night, the 13th of September, 1894, and I'll give you just exactly what occurred, and may God's hand strike me down if I go one inch over the truth. I had been at Bristol in the summer looking for work, and then I had a notion that I might get something at Portsmouth, for I was trained as a skilled mechanic, so I came tramping my way across the south of England and doing odd jobs as I went. I was trying all I knew to keep off the cross, for I had done a year in Exeter jail, and I had had enough of visiting Queen Victoria. But it's cruel hard to get work when once the black mark is against your name, and it was all I could do to keep soul and body together. At last, after ten days of woodcutting and stone-breaking on starvation pay, I found myself near Salisbury with a couple of shillings in my pocket and my boots and my patience clean wore out. There's an ale-house called The Willing Mind, which stands on the road between Blandford and Salisbury, and it was there that night I engaged a bed. I was sitting alone in the tap-room, just about closing time, when the innkeeper, Alan his name was, came beside me and began yarning about the neighbors. He was a man that liked to talk, and to have someone to listen to his talk, so I sat there smoking and drinking a mug of ale which he had stood me, and I took no great interest in what he said until he began to talk, as the devil would have it, about the riches of Mannering Hall. "'Meaning the large house on the right before I came to the village,' said I, "'the one that stands in its own park?' "'Exactly,' said he, "'and I am giving all our talk so that you may know that I am telling you the truth and hiding nothing.' the long white house with the pillars said he at the side of the blandford road now i had looked at it as i passed and it had crossed my mind as such thoughts will that it was a very easy house to get into with that great row of ground windows and glass doors i had put the thought away from me and now here was this landlord bringing it back with his talk about the riches within i said nothing but i listened and as luck would have it he would always come back to this one subject. He was a miser young, so you can think what he has now in his age, said he. Well, he's had some good out of his money. What good can he have had if he does not spend it, said I. Well, it bought him the prettiest wife in England, and that was some good that he got out of it. She thought she would have the spending of it, but she knows the difference now. "'Who was she then?' I asked, just for the sake of something to say. "'She was nobody at all until the old lord made her his lady,' said he. "'She came from up London way, and some said that she had been on the stage there, but nobody knew. "'The old lord was away for a year, and when he come home he brought a young wife back with him, "'and there she has been ever since.' Stevens, the butler, did tell me once that she was the light of the house when first she came, but what with her husband's mean and aggravatin' way, and what with her loneliness, for he hates to see a visitor within his doors, and what with his bitter words, for he has a tongue like a hornet sting, her life all went out of her, and she became a white, silent creature, moping about the country lanes. Some say that she loved another man, and that it was just the riches of the old lord which tempted her to be false to her lover, and that now she is eating her heart out because she has lost the one without being any nearer to the other, for she might be the poorest woman in the parish for all the money that she has the handling of. Well, sir, you can imagine that it did not interest me very much to hear about the quarrels between a lord and a lady. What did it matter to me if she hated the sound of his voice, or if he put every indignity upon her in the hope of breaking her spirit, and spoke to her as he would never have dared to speak to one of his servants? The landlord told me of these things, and of many more like them, but they passed out of my mind, for they were no concern of mine. But what I did want to hear was the form in which Lord Mannering kept his riches. Title deeds and stock certificates are but paper, 
and more danger than profit to the man who takes them. But metal and stones are worth a risk. And then, as if he were answering my very thoughts, the landlord told me of Lord Mannering's great collection of gold medals, that it was the most valuable in the world, and that it was reckoned that if they were put into a sack, the strongest man in the parish would not be able to raise them. Then his wife called him, and he and I went to our beds. I am not arguing to make out a case for myself, but I beg you, sir, to bear all the facts in your mind, and to ask yourself whether a man could be more sorely tempted than I was. I make bold to say that there are few who could have held out against it. There I lay on my bed that night, a desperate man, without hope or work, and with my last shilling in my pocket. I had tried to be honest, and honest folk had turned their backs upon me. They taunted me for theft and yet they pushed me towards it. I was caught in the stream and could not get out. And then it was such a chance, the great house all lined with windows, the golden metals which could so easily be melted down. It was like putting a loaf before a starving man and expecting him not to eat it. I fought against it for a time, but it was no use. At last I sat up on the side of my bed, and I swore that that night I should either be a rich man and able to give up crime for ever, or that the iron should be on my wrists once more. Then I slipped on my clothes, and having put a shilling on the table, for the landlord had treated me well and I did not wish to cheat him, I passed out through the windows into the garden of the inn. There was a high wall round this garden, and I had a job to get over it, but once on the other side it was all plain sailing. I did not meet a soul upon the road, and the iron gate of the avenue was open. No one was moving at the lodge, the moon was shining, and I could see the great house glimmering white through an archway of trees. I walked up it for a quarter of a mile or so until I was at the very edge of the drive, where it ended in a broad graveled space before the main door. There I stood in the shadow and looked at the long building with a full moon shining in every window and silvering the high stone front. I crouched there for some time, and I wondered where I should find the easiest entrance. The corner window of the side seemed to be the one which was least overlooked, and a screen of ivy hung heavily over it. My best chance was evidently there. I worked my way under the trees to the back of the house, and then crept along in the black shadow of the building. A dog barked and rattled his chain, but I stood waiting until he was quiet, and then I stole on once more until I came to the window which I had chosen. It is astonishing how careless they are in the country, in places far removed from large towns, where the thought of burglars never enters their heads. I call it setting temptation in a poor man's way, when he puts his hand, meaning no harm, upon a door and finds it swing open before him. In this case it was not so bad as that, but the window was merely fastened with the ordinary catch, which I opened with a push from the blade of my knife. I pulled up the window as quickly as possible, and then I thrust the knife through the slit in the shutter and pried it open. They were folding shutters, and I shoved them before me and walked into the room. "'Good evening, sir. You are very welcome,' said a voice. "'I've had some starts in my life, but never one to come up to that one. There, in the opening of the shutters, within reach of my arm, was standing a woman with a small coil of wax taper burning in her hand. She was tall and straight and slender, with a beautiful white face that might have been cut out of clear marble, but her hair and eyes were as black as night. She was dressed in some sort of white dressing-gown which flowed down to her feet, and what with this robe and what with her face, it seemed as if a spirit from above was standing in front of me. My knees knocked together, and I held on to the shutter with one hand to give me support. I should have turned and run away if I had had the strength, but I could only just stand and stare at her. She soon brought me back to myself once more. "'Don't be frightened,' said she, and they were strange words for the mistress of a house to have to use to a burglar. I saw you out of my bedroom window when you were hiding under those trees, so I slipped downstairs, and then I heard you at the window. I should have opened it for you if you had waited, but you managed it yourself, just as I came up. I still held in my hand the long clasp knife with which I had opened the shutter. 
I was unshaven and grimed from a week on the roads. Altogether, there are few people who would have cared to face me alone at one in the morning. But this woman, if I had been her lover meeting her by appointment, could not have looked upon me with a more welcoming eye. She laid her hand upon my sleeve and drew me into the room. "'What's the meaning of this, ma'am? Don't get trying any little games upon me,' said I, in my roughest way, and I can put it in a rough when I like. "'It'll be the worst for you if you play me any trick.' i added showing her my knife i will play you no trick said she on the contrary i am your friend and i wish to help you excuse me ma'am but i find it hard to believe that said i why should you wish to help me i have my own reasons said she and then suddenly with those black eyes blazing out of her white face it's because i hate him hate him hate him now you understand I remembered what the landlord had told me, and I did understand. I looked at her ladyship's face, and I knew that I could trust her. She wanted to revenge herself upon her husband. She wanted to hit him where it would hurt him most, upon the pocket. She hated him so that she would even lower her pride to take such a man as me into her confidence if she could gain her end by doing so. I've hated some folk in my time, but I don't think I ever understood what hate was until I saw that woman's face in the light of the taper. You'll trust me now, she said, with another coaxing touch upon my sleeve. Yes, your ladyship. You know me, then. I can guess who you are. I dare say my wrongs are the talk of the county, but what does he care for that? He only cares for one thing in the whole world, and that you can take from him this night. Have you a bag? no your ladyship shut the shutter behind you then no one can see the light you are quite safe the servants all sleep in the other wing i can show you where all the most valuable things are you cannot carry them all so we must pick the best the room in which i found myself was long and low with many rugs and skins scattered about on a polished wood floor small cases stood here and there and the walls were decorated with spears and swords and paddles and other things which find their way into museums there were some queer clothes too which had been brought from savage countries and the lady took down a large leather sack bag from among them this sleeping sack will do said she now come with me and i will show you where the metals are it was like a dream to me to think that this tall white woman was the lady of the house and that she was lending me a hand to rob her own home i could have burst out laughing at the thought of it and yet there was something in that pale face of hers which stopped my laughter and turned me cold and serious she swept on in front of me like a spirit with a green taper in her hand and i walked behind with my sack until we came to a door at the end of the museum it was locked but the key was in it and she led me through the room beyond was a small one hung all round with curtains which had pictures on them it was the hunting of a deer that was painted on it as i remember and in the flicker of that light you'd have sworn that the dogs and the horses were streaming round the walls the only other thing in the room was a row of cases made of walnut with brass ornaments they had glass tops and beneath this glass i saw the long lines of those gold medals some of them as big as a plate and half an inch thick all resting upon red velvet and glowing and gleaming in the darkness my fingers were just itching to be at them and i slipped my knife under the lock of one of the cases to wrench it open wait a moment said she laying her hand upon my arm you might do better than this i am very well satisfied ma'am said i and much obliged to your ladyship for kind assistance you can do better she repeated would not golden sovereigns be worth more to you than these things why yes said i that's the best of all well said she he sleeps just above our head it is but one short staircase there is a tin box with money enough to fill this bag under his bed how can i get it without waking him what matter if he does wake she looked very hard at me as she spoke you could keep him from calling out no no ma'am i'll have none of that just as you like said she i thought that you were a stout-hearted sort of man by your appearance but i see that i made a mistake if you are afraid to run the risk of one old man then of course you cannot have the gold which is under his bed 
you are the best judge of your own business but i should think that you would do better at some other trade i'll not have murder on my conscience you could overpower him without harming him i never said anything of murder the money lies under the bed but if you are faint-hearted it is better that you should not attempt it she worked upon me so partly with her scorn and partly with this money that she held before my eyes that i believe i should have yielded and taken my chances upstairs had it not been that i saw her eyes following the struggle within me in such a crafty malignant fashion that it was evident she had bent upon making me the tool of her revenge and that she would leave me no choice but to do the old man an injury or to be captured by him she felt suddenly that she was giving herself away and she changed her face to a kindly friendly smile but it was too late for i had had my warning i will not go upstairs said i i have all i want here she looked her contempt at me and there never was a face which could look it plainer very good you can take these medals i should be glad if you would begin at this end i suppose they will all be the same value when melted down but these are the ones which are the rarest and therefore the most precious to him it is not necessary to break the locks if you press that brass knob you will find that there is a secret spring so take that small one first it is the very apple of his eye she had opened one of the cases and the beautiful things all lay exposed before me i had my hand upon the one which she had pointed out when suddenly a change came over her face and she held up one finger as a warning hist she whispered what is that far away in the silence of the house we heard a low dragging shuffling sound and the distant tread of feet she closed and fastened the case in an instant it's my husband she whispered all right don't be alarmed i'll arrange it here quick behind the tapestry she pushed me behind the painted curtains upon the wall my empty leather bag still in my hand then she took her taper and walked quickly into the room from which we had come from where i stood i could see her through the open door is that you robert she cried the light of a candle shone through the door of the museum and the shuffling steps came nearer and nearer then i saw a face in the doorway a great heavy face all lines and creases with a huge curving nose and a pair of gold glasses fixed across it he had to throw his head back to see through the glasses and that great nose thrust out in front of him like the beak of some sort of fowl he was a big man very tall and burly so that in his loose dressing-gown his figure seemed to fill up the whole doorway he had a pile of grey curling hair all round his head but his face was clean-shaven his mouth was thin and small and prim hidden away under his long masterful nose he stood there holding the candle in front of him and looking at his wife with a queer malicious gleam in his eyes it only needed that one look to tell me that he was as fond of her as she was of him how's this he asked some new tantrum what do you mean by wandering about the house why don't you go to bed i could not sleep she answered she spoke languidly and wearily if she was an actress once she had not forgotten her calling might i suggest said he in the same mocking kind of voice that a good conscience is an excellent aid to sleep that cannot be true she answered for you sleep very well i have only one thing in my life to be ashamed of said he and his hair bristled up with anger until he looked like an old cockatoo you know best what that is it is a mistake which has brought its own punishment with it to me as well as to you remember that you have very little to whine about it was i who stooped and you who rose rose yes rose i suppose you do not deny that it is promotion to exchange the music hall for mannering hall fool that i was ever to take you out of your true sphere if you think so why do you not separate because private misery is better than public humiliation because it is easier to suffer for a mistake than to own to it because also i like to keep you in my sight and to know that you cannot go back to him you villain you cowardly villain yes yes my lady i know your secret ambition but it shall never be while i live 
and if it happens after my death i will at least take care that you go to him as a beggar you and dear edward will never have the satisfaction of squandering my savings and you may make up your mind to that my lady why are those shutters and the window open i found the night very close it is not safe how do you know that some tramp may not be outside are you aware that my collection of medals is worth more than any similar collection in the world you have left the door open also what is there to prevent any one from rifling the cases well, i was here i know you were i heard you moving about in the metal room and that was why i came down what were you doing looking at the metals what else should i be doing this curiosity is something new he looked suspiciously at her and moved on towards the inner room she walking beside him it was at this moment that i saw something which startled me I had laid my clasp knife open upon the top of one of the cases, and there it lay in full view. She saw it before he did, and with a woman's cunning she held her taper out so that the light of it came between Lord Mannering's eyes and the knife. Then she took it in her left hand and held it against her gown out of his sight. He looked about from case to case. I could have put my hand at one time upon his long nose, but there was nothing to show that the metals had been tampered with, and so, still snarling and grumbling, he shuffled off into the other room once more. And now I have to speak of what I heard rather than of what I saw, but I swear to you, as I shall stand some day before my Maker, that what I say is the truth. When they passed into the outer room I saw him lay his candle upon the corner of one of the tables, and he sat himself down, but in such a position that he was just out of my sight. She moved behind him, as I could tell from the fact that the light of her taper threw his long, lumpy shadow upon the floor in front of him. Then he began talking about this man whom he called Edward, and every word that he said was like a blistering drop of vitriol. He spoke low, so that I could not hear it all, but from what I heard I should guess that she would as soon have been lashed with a whip. At first she said some hot words in reply, but then she was silent, and he went on and on in that cold, mocking voice of his, nagging and insulting and tormenting, until I wondered that she could bear to stand there in silence and listen to it then suddenly i heard him say in a sharp voice come from behind me leave go of my collar what would you dare to strike me there was a sound like a blow just a soft sort of thud and then i heard him cry out my god it's blood he shuffled with his feet as if he was getting up and then i heard another blow and he cried out oh you she-devil and was quiet except for a dripping and splashing upon the floor I ran out from behind my curtain at that, and rushed into the other room, shaking all over with the horror of it. The old man had slipped down in the chair, and his dressing-gown had rucked up until he looked as if he had a monstrous hump to his back. His head, with the gold glasses still fixed on his nose, was lolling over upon one side, and his little mouth was open just like a dead fish. I could not see where the blood was coming from, but I could still hear it drumming upon the floor. She stood behind him with the candle shining full upon her face. Her lips were pressed together and her eyes shining, and a touch of color had come into each of her cheeks. It just wanted that to make her the most beautiful woman I had ever seen in my life. "'You've done it now,' said I. "'Yes,' said she in her quiet way, "'I've done it now.' "'What are you going to do?' I asked. "'They'll have you for murder as sure as fate.' "'Never fear about me. I have nothing to live for, and it does not matter. Give me a hand to set him straight in the chair. It is horrible to see him like this.' I did so, though it turned me cold all over to touch him. Some of his blood came on my hand and sickened me. "'Now,' said she, "'you may as well have the medals as anyone else. Take them and go.' "'I don't want them.' I only want to get away. I was never mixed up with a business like this before. Nonsense, said she. You came for the medals, and here they are at your mercy. Why should you not have them? There is no one to prevent you. I held the bag still in my hand. She opened the case, and between us we threw a hundred or so of the medals into it. 
They were all from the one case, but I could not bring myself to wait for any more. Then I made for the window, for the very air of this house seemed to poison me after what I had seen and heard. As I looked back I saw her standing there, tall and graceful, with the light in her hand, just as I had seen her first. She waved good-bye, and I waved back at her, and sprang out into the gravel drive. I thank God that I can lay my hand upon my heart and say that I have never done a murder, but perhaps it would be different if I had been able to read that woman's mind and thoughts. There might have been two bodies in the room instead of one if I could have seen behind that last smile of hers, but I thought of nothing but of getting safely away, and it never entered my head how she might be fixing the rope round my neck. I had not taken five steps out from that window, skirting below the shadow of the house in the way that I had come, when I heard a scream that might have raised the parish, and then another and another. "'Murder!' she cried. "'Murder! Murder! Help!' And her voice rang out in the quiet of the night-time and sounded over the whole countryside. It went through my head, that dreadful cry. In an instant lights began to move and windows to fly up, not only in the house behind me, but in the lodge and in the stables in front. Like a frightened rabbit I bolted down the drive, but I heard the clang of the gate being shut before I could reach it. Then I hid my bag of metals under some dry faggots, and I tried to get away across the park, but someone saw me in the moonlight, and presently I had half a dozen of them with dogs upon my heels. I crouched down among the brambles, but those dogs were too many for me, and I was glad enough when the men came up and prevented me from being torn into pieces. They seized me and dragged me back to the room from which I had come. "'Is this the man, your ladyship?' asked the oldest of them, the same whom I found out afterwards to be the butler." She had been bending over the body with her handkerchief to her eyes, and now she turned upon me with the face of a fury. Oh, what an actress that woman was! Yes, yes, it is a very man, she cried. Oh, you villain, you cruel villain, to treat an old man so! There was a man there who seemed to be a village constable. He laid his hand upon my shoulder. What do you say to that? said he. "'It was she who did it,' I cried, pointing at the woman, whose eyes never flinched before mine. "'Come, come, try another,' said the constable, and one of the men-servants struck at me with his fist. "'I tell you that I saw her do it. She stabbed him twice with a knife. She first helped me to rob him, and then she murdered him.' The footman tried to strike me again, but she held up her hand— do not hurt him she said i think that his punishment may safely be left to the law i'll see to that your ladyship said the constable your ladyship actually saw the crime committed did you not yes yes i saw it with my own eyes it was horrible we heard the sound and we came down my poor husband was in front the man had one of the cases open and was filling a black leather bag which he held in his hand he rushed past us and my husband seized him there was a struggle, and he stabbed him twice. There you can see the blood upon his hands. If I am not mistaken, his knife is still in Lord Mannering's body. Look at the blood upon her hands, I cried. She has been holding up his lordship's head, you lying rascal, said the butler. And here's the very sack her ladyship spoke of, said the constable, as a groom came in with the one which I had dropped in my flight. And here are the medals inside it. "'That's good enough for me. We will keep him safe here to-night, and to-morrow the inspector and I can take him into Salisbury.' "'Poor creature,' said the woman. "'For my own part I forgive him any injury which he has done me. Who knows what temptation may have driven him to crime. His conscience and the law will give him punishment enough without any reproach of mine rendering it more bitter.' I could not answer. I tell you, sir, I could not answer, so taken aback was I by the assurance of the woman. And so, seeming by my silence to agree to all that she had said, I was dragged away by the butler and the constable into the cellar, in which they locked me for the night. There, sir, I have told you the whole story of the events which led up to the murder of Lord Mannering by his wife, upon the night of september the fourth in the year eighteen ninety four perhaps you will put my statement on one side as the constable did at mannering towers or the judge afterwards at the county assizes 
or perhaps you will see that there is the ring of truth in what i say and you will follow it up and so make your name for ever as a man who does not grudge personal trouble where justice is to be done i have only you to look to sir and if you will clear my name of this false accusation then i will worship you as one man never yet worshipped another but if you fail me then i give you my solemn promise that i will rope myself up this day month to the bar of my window and from that time on i will come to plague you in your dreams if ever yet one man was able to come back and to haunt another what i ask you to do is very simple make inquiries about this woman watch her learn her past history find out what use she is making of the money which has come to her and whether there is not a man edward as i have stated if from this you learn anything which shows you her real character or which seems to you to corroborate the story which i have told you then i am sure that i can rely upon your goodness of heart to come to the rescue of an innocent man End of Story 17 End of Round the Fire Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle